Carol Anderson has been making the rounds. She's a historian originally out of Ohio State, and basically her deal is if she doesn't like something in the Constitution, it must be racist. This is not her. This is Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, and she's another hardcore leftist activist. I read up a little bit about her. She was born to a man who was a wobbly, as they used to call him, essentially a communist, and uh, moved to San Francisco and joined on the faculty, and she has been pumping hard with the leftist activism ever since. But this is about Carol Anderson. Carol Anderson's going to weigh in on police brutality, and you'll be left wondering, how in the hell do these people get a PhD? Hello out there. I am trying to get through. With his powerful brainwaves cradled in the warmth of reasoning, it's time for Johnny Walker Dread to straighten you out on a thing or two. Emanating all the way from exciting Las Vegas, Oklahoma, it's the Johnny Walker Dread Show. I wonder what you think, if you think the re- there's a relationship between slave patrols and policing today. It seems that fear and that um, that absolute sense of control and just the image of a black man running and getting shot in the back. And these often these policemen say things like, I don't know why I did that or I didn't mean to do that or I thought it was my taser. But it's almost like it's a, in their DNA. And I'm just wondering if you think that there's there's a lineage of uh, the slave patrols. I know Mumia Abdul Jabbar uh, wrote a um, a little pamphlet on this that was very convincing argument. Um, but I think in in your book you you kind of separate the formation of police from the slave patrols. That's right. The police officer mistook her taser for a firearm or her firearm for a taser because she's descendant from a long line of slave patrols. That's the latest. You see, the police are descendants from the slave patrols that took place before and after the Civil War. And that's the reason why they're out to get black people. Okay. Sure. By the way, uh, I wonder if that's her real hair. Mm, hard to tell. Uh, and so what I see, though, is the, the, the through line of anti-blackness and defining African-Americans as dangerous, as threatening. And so I juxtapose, for instance, uh, the treatment of Kyle Rittenhouse, who was the 17-year-old a white teenager who had an illegally acquired AR-15, crosses state lines, goes to Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, and the police welcome him, um, offering him water, you know, saying, we really appreciate that you're here in the middle of a mass protest against the shooting of a black man, Jacob Blake, seven times in the back. Okay, so you see a person who cannot read anything up about an event like the Kenosha shootings and distill anything close to being accurate, somehow got a doctorate in history. And if she screwed this thing up so much, how should we treat her other scholarly endeavors? So let's say it one more time, okay? Kyle Rittenhouse did not take a gun from Illinois to Wisconsin. He didn't go there to shoot people. He wasn't welcomed by the police. They didn't have a banner out there. Welcome, Kyle Rittenhouse. Didn't happen like that. She has completely distorted what took place. And again, if she's doing that to this event, what is she doing to the other historical events that she talks about so often, including the Second Amendment? This is the same lady who's trying now to dismantle your gun rights because they're racist. And of course, where does she get that? Well, it turns out that Patrick Henry and George Mason, um, those two guys were kind of racist, and so they liked the Second Amendment idea, and therefore the Second Amendment must be based on controlling slaves. It's pure horse manure. Thank you. 
That's what was happening in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And you have Kyle Rittenhouse crossing state lines to, 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 to protect property, he said. To protect property, he said. As if, well, that's just what he said, but what was he really doing? But then they'll turn around and say, well, he shot protesters because he valued property more than he did human life. So which is it? Was he there to protect property or not? And the truth of it is, is he went there to protect property and then later abandoned the property because it became under police control and went out looking to help injured people and was ambushed. Again, she has no understanding of what took place that night. Or she does, and she's just distorting reality. Either way, it doesn't speak highly of a scholar. And the police welcoming him. They don't see him as a threat. Instead, instead they said, we really appreciate that you guys are here. He then goes and he guns down three people, killing two and seriously wounding a third. All right. Okay, so here we go. Um, the police did not see him as a threat. And you know why? Because the police are there to try to keep people from burning down houses and buildings. And Kyle and them are not doing that. In fact, they're trying to prevent people from doing that. And so, yeah, the police are going to probably look pretty kindly on Kyle and his compadres. That's why it's not because Kyle was white. The people that the police were battling all night were white, too. They favored Kyle, in a sense, because of Kyle's behavior. Kyle was not hurting people. As far as the water bottle goes, man, I am sick of tired of hearing about that water bottle. Look, Kyle and his compadres got tear gassed. They need something to flush the water out, so Kyle asked them for a bottle of water, and they gave him one. Big deal. It's not like they handed him a whole case of beer. He walks towards the police with his hands up as if to surrender, and they just go right by him. Oh, by the way, I should mention also her characterization of the shootings. He just went there and then shot three people. Now, she's supposed to be a historian scholar, and that's her take on it. No mention of the fact that Joseph Rosenbaum ambushed Kyle, that Joseph Rosenbaum chased Kyle, threw an object at him tried to take his gun from him, no mention of the gunshot that went off, the fact that a mob was chasing him and tried to kill him, no mention of that. Instead, it's Kyle went to Kenosha and just gunned three people down. This is your historian scholar here, and she does the same kind of distortions when it comes to the Second Amendment. She's a propaganda artist. Again, got to be careful about this kind of stuff. She is not an intellectual. In fact, she comes off to me as a little bit dim, but that's me. They don't see this white 17-year-old carrying an AR-15 as a threat. Meanwhile, in Cleveland, Ohio, you have 12-year-old Tamir Rice, who is playing in a park by himself in an open carry state with a toy gun. And granted, the gun didn't have the orange tip on it that says, hi, I'm a toy, but Ohio is an open carry state. Granted, he took the orange tip off of the toy pistol. That's kind of an important point. Hey, look, I understand. He's 12 years old. He didn't know better, but you just can't do that. They put the orange tip on those little pistols for a reason. It's to alert the police, especially, that this is a toy, not a real gun. Quick, which one of those two is a real pistol? Okay, if you couldn't figure it out by now, the police couldn't have. That's about how much time they had to make that decision. I believe the one on the upper right is Tammy Rice's toy pistol. And the one on the bottom left looks like a real pistol. But I have to look pretty hard. And for a, a lot longer than those police officers did. So why did Tamara Rice take the orange tip off? It's more fun to play with a toy gun if it looks like a real gun. I get it. He's just, he's just a young kid. His parents should have taught him a little bit better in that regard. But it's a tragic mistake. But the police officers didn't go out hunting for Tamir Rice that day, and they didn't shoot him because he was black. They were told that there is about a 16-year-old kid wandering around waving a pistol at people. Okay, that's a dangerous situation. Yes, Tamir is only 12. He looks 16. He's big. He's a really big kid. And confirmation bias. If you're looking for a 16-year-old, a person that you're going to see is going to look 16 years old. And so they thought they had the suspect, and they get out of their cars, and what does Tammy Rice do? He pulls the gun on him. And 
you have to teach your kids you can't do those kind of things. When the police pull up, you have to recognize the fact that they are going to be on high alert. Whatever toy gun you have, leave it where it is. He didn't do it. He pulled it out, and it cost him his life. Yes, the police probably overreacted a little bit, but this whole idea somehow that they shot him because he's black is a total farce, and this is the person that's buying into that and trying to tell you that that's what the reason was. This is race baiting of the highest order. And as long as you're not pointing the gun at anybody, you're fine. Okay. She mentions in Ohio is an open carry state. Well, gee, she doesn't talk about the open carry state when it comes to Kyle Rittenhouse, does she? No, does not mention it at all. And the statute doesn't say, as long as you don't point it at anybody, you're fine. It doesn't say that. Quit lying. You're not a threat. The pavilion, the park was empty. He was not a threat. The police rolled up and within two seconds, they shot him. And, and what they said was, we were, he was a threat. He was dangerous. We were fearful. That's the language that we hear over and over. He was dangerous. We were, we were threatened. We were fearful. I mean, so this is what you hear with, with Eric Garner. This is what you hear with George Floyd. This is what you hear with Walter Scott. This is what you hear. 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 What the hell kind of narrative is this? So she mentions Floyd, Scott, and Garner. Remember those names. We'll come back to this in a moment. So the way that the anti-blackness of threat danger operates is that it creates, it puts the precarity of black life front and center so that there's no place that you can be where this hyper policing does not put your life on the line. You're in your car. You are you. You can get got. You are walking in the park. You can get got. OK, so here we go. You're not safe no matter what you're doing. If you're just sitting in your car, well, they can kill you. If you're just walking in the park, they can just kill you. When people like this send that message constantly, it builds paranoia. The truth of it is, all of this is unfounded. Yeah, it's quite possible that you get shot by the police if you're minding your own business and doing nothing wrong, but it's extremely, extremely unlikely. She mentioned George Floyd, Walter Scott, Eric Garner. Were they just walking down the street, minding their own business? No. All of them had criminal records, and all of them disobeyed the police. Obstruction. Refused to go along. And I'm not saying that the shootings were justified or the killings were justified here, but this idea somehow that because those three died, that means that you're not safe no matter what you do. It's getting people killed. Look, we should be sending out the message to everybody that when the police pull you over, it's not time to be a jackass. You have to go along with what they're saying. You may not like it, and there's recourse for you if they ask you to do something you shouldn't. But that's not the message she's sending out. She is sending out the idea that the police are out there to kill you and that you're safe no matter what you do. In reality, you're more likely to get killed by one of your friends than you are the police. And if she disagrees with that notion, she can look the statistics up herself. She won't. She doesn't want to know the truth, nor does she want to tell the truth. And that's the modern American scholar. You are in your home. You are not safe. Think about Brianna Taylor. So this is what that kind of precarity as danger, threat means um, with the policing and with citizens. So think about Trayvon Martin. Okay, let's talk about Brianna Taylor. Um, how can her shooting be race related? They didn't barge in, see her. Oh my gosh, black woman, open fire, guys. It didn't happen that way. They had a no knock warrant. And yeah, the police may have made some serious mistakes there, but they didn't shoot Breonna Taylor because she was black or because they feared her blackness. They didn't even see her. And I should remind her. 
that Rosina Nicholas and Dennis Tuttle, the Harding Street Massacre in Houston, where the police on a similar no-knock warrant barged in, killed them both and the dog on a completely fake warrant. This happened about a year before the Breonna Taylor deal. I've had videos on it. What they did was they created a fake informant, a person that never even existed, claimed that this person bought drugs out of the house, used that to get a warrant, barged in, and killed them both. They were white, and the two police officers that concocted this thing, black. And you will not hear Carol Anderson talk about that event at all. And here's what's really important. If you bring that up to Carol Anderson, she will not mention it afterwards. Again, this is a race baiter, a propaganda artist. The truth means nothing. Now let's talk about Trayvon Martin. Um, who was a 17-year-old who was just walking to a convenience store and had Skittles and iced tea. And George Zimmerman, the neighborhood watch captain, sees him and starts going, oh, this guy looks really suspicious. There's something going on and they always get away. And he gets out of his car with a loaded Glock. A gl loaded nine millimeter to, to, um, to stalk this child through that community. All of a sudden, Trayvon Martin becomes a child, but she doesn't talk about Kyle Rittenhouse as a child. They're the same age. Hmm, a little bias showing up here, perhaps? And he kills Trayvon, but the narrative becomes Trayvon was a thug. He was big. He was black. He was he was a criminal. He was a drug drug smoking, uh, a hoodie wearing, grilled up thug. And poor George had no nothing else that he could do but to defend himself. All right. Let me say something about Trayvon Martin. Yes. They did describe him as a thug. They brought up a lot about his past. But you know why? It was because all we heard was about how much of an honor student he was. As soon as Trayvon Martin was killed, out came the graduation pictures. Out came all the stories about how smart he was and how great he was and what a cool dude he was. And sure, you start waving that in front of people and they're going to start investigating. And when they find out that things are not quite like that, they're going to jump on it. That's the way it goes. If you don't like it, Quit extolling the virtues of some of these kids. Look, Trayvon Martin was a 17-year-old kid who was killed by George Zimmerman. It might have been justified. It might not have been. And we need to leave it at that. Because Trayvon was the threat. How does an unarmed teenager become the threat when stalked by a man who has a loaded gun? Well, that's easy. You run in from behind him and jump him. That's that's exactly what George Zimmerman is claiming happened. We weren't there. You weren't there, Carol. Neither was I. We have no way of knowing what exactly happened there. The jury saw the evidence. They decided that George Zimmerman acted in self-defense. You know what? Maybe the jury got it wrong, but we have no way of saying otherwise because we weren't there. Anti-blackness. And, and Zimmerman walked. Yeah, and he walked under the um, stand your ground, right? Yes. Um, so his defense didn't use stand your ground, but the police investigation was, a, was, was predicated on stand your ground, and the judge's instructions to the jury were predicated on stand your ground. That's a fat lie. Let's take a look at the jury instructions. Okay, here are the jury instructions for George Zimmerman. I'll go ahead and just type in here. Stand your ground. It only shows up once right here. One time in the entire document. If George Zimmerman was not engaged in an unlawful activity, and by the way, all you Kyle Rittenhouse anti-Kyles out there, uh, this is not Wisconsin law. This is Florida. Big difference. And was attacked in any place where he had a right to be. Um, a little grammar problem there, but okay. He had no duty to retreat and had the right to stand his ground and meet force with force, including deadly force, if he reasonably believed that it was necessary to do so to prevent death or great bodily harm to himself or another to prevent the commission of a forcible felony. These jury instructions are just stating what the general self-defense laws are. They're not predicated on stand your ground, and she's right on one thing, 
the defense never bothered to even do a stand your ground defense because George Zimmerman was not standing his ground. George Zimmerman was claiming that Trayvon Martin was on top of him and that he could not leave. If George Zimmerman had proposed stand your ground, that would have eliminated his self defense claim. At no point did the jury here consider stand your ground as the defense. In the jury instructions, don't tell them to. These are general jury instructions. Yes, George Zimmerman had a right to stand his ground. He also had a right to free speech. He had a right to a lot of things. That doesn't mean that the case is predicated on it. In short, the George Zimmerman trial was not a stand your ground trial and the jury did not use stand your ground as a basis for his defense. And what we know about stand your ground is that it expands the castle doctrine. Um, and the castle doctrine says if somebody comes into your home, you have the right to defend yourself. But stand your ground says anywhere that you have a right to be. And if you perceive a threat, you can defend yourself. Well, when black is the default threat in American society, it means that black people can easily be gunned down and it'd be found justifiable homicide. She would have a point if this was a stand your ground case. If George Zimmerman was standing there and shot Trayvon Martin and claimed, hey man, I could have retreated, but damn it, I don't have to, this is Florida. She might have had a point. But that's not what happened. At least that's not what George Zimmerman's claim is. And since the jury ruled to acquit George Zimmerman, then they must have felt that George Zimmerman's claim was valid. In other words, it had nothing to do with stand your ground. The data are clear. Whites who kill blacks are 10 times more likely to have it ruled as justifiable homicide than blacks who kill whites using stand your ground. Whites who kill blacks have a 281% um, likelihood of being found justifiable homicide than whites who kill whites. Okay, first rule for you guys out there listening, never trust her on anything. I'm gonna go ahead and check into those statistics. My gut feeling is, is that they've been cherry picked and they really don't reflect what she's claiming. Keep in mind, there's another thing you have to think about. A lot of these statistics that are thrown around are really class-based, in other words, poverty-based. It's quite often that whites get off on certain crimes more often because they're a little bit richer and they can afford better attorneys. It's not a race issue, it's, it's poverty. Poor whites get slammed around by the justice system just as badly. Having blacks as the victim makes the threat of stand your ground much more plausible in a defense. So there you have it. Kyle Rittenhouse, he just showed up in Kenosha and started shooting people. And the, and the police gave him water. And Tamir Rice, well, they shot him because he's black. Oh, the fact that he pulled the orange tip off of that gun, that had nothing to do with it. No, it was simply by the fact that they saw a black kid. Hey, let's shoot this black kid because we feel threatened by black people. Come on, those police officers on a daily basis encounter black teenagers all the time. As far as I know, this is the first time that either of them shot anybody. Why? If they're really that threatened, wouldn't they be shooting people all the freaking time? Breonna Taylor, there's no evidence whatsoever that her race played any role in the shootings, and in fact, I fail to see how it could have. They didn't see her. So, yeah, this is what we give PhDs out to nowadays. Some scholar. And if she's willing to lie and exaggerate and totally miss the point on something like this, then what good is her scholarship? Her Second Amendment arguments, by the way, are just bizarre. But they're falling in favor with a lot of people who want to take people's guns from them 
And that pesky Second Amendment, well, what do we do about it? I know, let's call it racist. And she's the pusher of this, but in my opinion, I wouldn't trust her as far as I could throw her. Like my video, subscribe to my channel.